Welcome to Craftlit, the podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 554. Happy Anniversary. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I am in shock. Yes, we have actually, and in fact, passed the two Craftlet 15-year anniversaries. There's the, I got the idea, I was crazy to have the idea, and I recorded the first episode anniversary. And then there's the, and I released it to the world anniversary. And everything changed in life for me when I did that in such wonderful and good ways. I am reminded of this every time I manage in the last couple of months to show up for our Zoom chats on Tuesday mornings, Eastern time, and Thursday nights, Eastern time. And anytime I get a spare second to look at Facebook, I I have to confess one of the things that having a job job has done to me is it really has kept me off of social media. And as much as I love seeing things from you guys, which I do, I can't say I miss the pressure of social media in general. Yeah, I can't say I miss it. I've been painting more, drawing more, taking online classes more on those things. And I don't know if I'm seeing improvement, but between ripping paper and scribbling colors in places and splashing colors in places, It's not a bad thing. Even if I'm not getting any better, it's pretty colors. And, you know, in a time like this, that's just great, I think. (laughs) If that's if that's all you can handle is listening to audiobooks and (laughs) and tearing paper and slapping pretty colors down, then that's fine. Oh, and getting rid of stuff in the basement. I will be making the second run to the thrift store tomorrow to drop things off, (laughs) not pick things up. Although I am going to be running by the hardware store to get more storage items. But aside from that, that's a different thing. Not just storage, organizational storage items. I'm figuring out how this family needs to have things organized, finally. (laughs) <laughs> finally. It only took me 25 years. That's all. Because, yeah, this is 15, 15 for Craftlet and 25 for Andrew and me this year, this October. I know. That's not for nothing. And aside from those things, honestly, there hasn't been anything else this week. I mean, there's always work, which is fascinating. It's really the first time, the last couple of months are really the first time that I've had a large group of people to work with who I'm, I guess, sort of de facto managing. And it's been spectacular because they're awesome. You know, creative, thoughtful, supportive of each other, and thoughtful, like, full of thought. They think things, big things, and good things. It's kind of like if you get a whole bunch of people in one job space who all want to make the world a better place, it's just kind of cool because you get a lot of really awesome people in that situation. And I love that. So lots and lots of good on that front, even if the, the rest of the world is struggling and having a hard time. It is, except for New Zealand and Australia, because y'all rock. But it is nice to be able to every day see proof that the the world is actually full of lovely, wonderful people. And on that note, it's time for us to get into Northanger Abbey. So last week we finished the official volume one. This saw the, the end of what would have been the first bound volume of the story. Now, one of the things that I've, I've started noticing about the copies of books that we have had 
that indicate where those volumes were, like a, according to some versions of the book or according to online digitized copies of the books. We're about to do chapters 16 and 17 today. According to one of the annotated copies I have, this is volume two, chapter one and chapter two. Whenever we've had a copy of a book that does that, that definitely makes that split between volumes, one of the things that I've noticed is that much like TV show scripts where they have to write in where the commercial breaks will be for American shows, because number one, if they're written for commercial television, there will be commercial breaks. And number two, even if they aren't necessarily written for television because of syndication and things like that, writers tended to be aware where the the rhythm of those breaks would happen. And even back in the day, and if you didn't see it, Maya Daguer posted a link for something that's happening tomorrow. So I'm, af I'm afraid this will only be useful for people who listen in real time. But tomorrow there's going to be a talk given by the Jane Austen Society in the UK about how Jane Austen reinvented the novel. And I am so excited to get a chance to listen to this because yes, and I can't wait to learn more on that topic. But along with perhaps reinventing the novel, as they will teach us tomorrow, she also, by the time she finished Northanger Abbey, second to last book she ever finished in her short life, she really knew her business. Because here at the volume break, which is roughly halfway through the book, you know, pretty, pretty darn close, they would have divided it mostly based on text length, the actual number of pages the book was taking up. But also they were going to have to cut it at a, a chapter break and then number the, the chapters accordingly. Not for nothing, everything shifts at this point in the text. Sometimes shifts like that are not necessarily good for either the reader or for the characters. In the situation that we're in this time, it's, it's not a bad shift, but it is a fascinating one because the, the first half of the book has really included an awful lot of Jane Austen breaking in in kind of a dear reader sort of Miss Manners style where she is instructing us what we should be recognizing in society. It's one of the ways that she's able to satirize the foibles of the way that society has uh, constructed itself in Bath around the pump room and around these, these dances and the book that you get to look in to see who's in town that week and all of all of these bits and pieces. Jane was was able to pop her own commentary in to give us her raised eyebrow and wink. And that's fun. But part of what she was doing in that situation was making sure we knew where the chessboard was. Who's on the chessboard? What are the rules of that chessboard? Because now we're going to change the chessboard. And these, these first two chapters that appeared in volume two are the, oh, so this is what's happening now, parts of the story. And some stories, that's a shift for the better. Some stories shift for the not so much better. And here it's, a, well, it could be either, depending on what you like best about Jane Austen. I personally get such a huge kick out of her comments in the first half of the book that this shift was actually kind of difficult for me the first time I read it. Since then, since reading it several times now, I no longer have problems with this shift. It is a heads up for you, though, that if you feel saddened at first by the shift we are about to encounter, please don't. We will continue to have wonderfully wry moments, but instead of them being Jane Austen winking at us over a cup of tea and time across the years, instead what we get to do is enjoy the fact that we now know enough about how Catherine works and enough about how Jane works that she can pull herself back a bit 
and instead just pay attention to being a really good writer because now the the satire and the the comedy shifts from this kind of overt impossible to miss speechifying that we got from Jane into her writing Catherine into situations where Catherine's behavior is Jane's commentary. Now, Jane, Jane has written Catherine to be 17 years old, which we know. Her brother's 20. There are two children in between them, so not for nothing. That house was crowded and crowded with a lot of the same age children. And so Catherine's commentary is on teaching children how to read <laughs> and history. <laughs> We knew before, but it is absolutely true. Those had to have been hard-won lessons that she learned. As a 17-year-old a girl who's, who has largely been out of public life her entire 17 years and has only really just begun to experience new people at all when you figure that the Allens were really the only people she had to go visit, uh, it's a, rather amazing that she is as socialized as she is. It says a lot about her, her parents and the Allens that they were able to prepare her enough for society from her, her countrified living as they were able to. But we, we have somebody who's a, an innocent when it comes to the world, an innocent in the machinations and manipulations that one could encounter in society, which we've certainly seen evidence of here, but we've also seen evidence of in so many of the books that we've read. But she's also and innocent in her ability to be honest. And I mean, kind of flatly honest. If she doesn't understand something that you say, Catherine is very likely to say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't understand. Not feeling guilty for not understanding, not feeling embarrassed for not understanding, not feeling irked that you have said something that she didn't understand, but just quite honestly, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. And that's a refreshing character. It's also a really hard character to write well and not allow them to start to look stupid because Catherine's not stupid and she does learn. And we have seen her slowly realize and then admit that she doesn't much like James or his behavior, but she also can't quite parse it because she knows her brother's a good person. And if James is his friend, then there is some cognitive dissonance going on. And she hasn't quite figured out how to calculate that, how to, how to file that information away. And I can respect that. That's a, a complicated and uncomfortable position to be in. She has started to see things in Isabella that she also isn't completely okay with. But again, her brother clearly cares about Isabella and she trusts her brother. So that's more of a challenge. We know that her brother has gone home to find out if his father will, their, their father will support him in marrying Isabella. And we find out how that comes out today. And we also find out how Catherine is feeling about all of that a little bit today. There are a few things to know before we start, some of the two chapters that we have today have, have language being used in interesting ways that we haven't really seen yet in the book. So I, I am going to go ahead and explain those like I usually do, but there are some items that I actually am going to hold back on and not explain until after we've listened to the chapter this week as well, just because I don't want to risk spoiling surprises and things like that for you. All right. So first thing is we've talked about dancing sets and how you have the two lines of people and a couple uh, girl side and a gentleman side for the dance and the gentleman and the lady meet up in the middle and then do the dance down the lines of people and then position themselves at the bottom of the line to move up through the line as the dance continues. A long set would not be describing the amount of time the song went on for. A long set would be how many people there are in line. So a short set would be if there were fewer people in line. Now, a long set would be lovely if you like the person you're dancing with because it would give you more opportunity to talk and 
that's great. A short set would be lovely if you didn't much like the person that you're talking to, because it won't last as long and there will be less time for you to talk. You'll hear the phrase, preparing to give them hands across. This is a dance maneuver. You have seen it in every Regency movie you have ever seen. Creating a square, two men, two women. Uh, the men would be next to each other. The women would be next to each other. So if you were looking at the square from the top, you would have, say, two women at the upper left and upper right position, two men at the lower left, lower right position. And hands across would be the man in the lower right reaches across, hands across, to the woman in the upper left. So diagonally, the gentleman in the lower left would reach across, hands across, to the woman in the upper right. They would then do some kind of dance maneuver clockwise, and then they would switch hands and do it anti-clockwise, counterclockwise. I believe when I was at Oxford, we were taught, I want to say it was a minuet, and this reminds me an awful lot of that because there's only so much you can do if your hands are engaged across a very small space. You know, only your arm's length is separating you from anyone at that point. There's not a whole lot of dance maneuvers that you can break into at that point. I do remember that the if it was a minuet that we learned, it was relentless on our calves because the dance maneuver that was required of us was all switching between walking like a normal person and then elevating yourself onto your toes and continuing to walk only on your toes and then lowering yourself to being flat foot and then lifting yourself again. So there was a lot of this lift, lower, lift, lower, lift, lower. And boy, did our calves hurt that night after we had practiced that. It was a lot. So I, I wonder if it was a minuet. I absolutely do not recall what the, the dance name was, but I do believe it was Regency-era-ish dance because I remember the way that she was describing the way that the women needed to stand. And, you know, the, the dresses at this time, along with the ampere waist and the short sleeves, you would of, often have during the day a sheer or sheer cotton or sheer muslin, sometimes kind of lacy, almost a, a dicky, like a, a fake collar. It would just be the no sleeves. It would just be a collar and fabric that would cover your chest and a little bit of your, your back. And then you'd put your dress on over that. So it wouldn't, um, it wouldn't add bulk to your bodice. And then, of course, for evening time, you wouldn't want to wear something like that. You would want your skin showing. And as we saw in Bridgerton, lots of skin sh could show <laughs> depending on who was in the room with you. But you'd have those lovely neoclassical scooped necks. Well, you're still wearing some kind of corsetry for support. And as we have learned from Craftlet listeners over the years and from Bernadette Banner and Abby Cox and all these YouTubers who do wonderful, wonderful instructional videos on these things, unlike my experience, my personal experience with a corset, they didn't have to be implements of torture. Instead, they could be actually made to fit your body and support your body. And in cases like what I'm going towards, maneuver your body into a shape that made a particular style of dress look particularly good on you. One of the ways that they, uh, that the corsets of the time would have done that here is they would have functioned kind of like a push-up bra. And this was one of the things that we were taught in, in the class at Oxford. This is ridiculous that I remember this. Part of the reason that the dance we were learning was choreographed the way it was and the stateliness of the dance as far as your footwork went was because one of the things that the women were supposed to be showing off was their excellent posture and their lovely bosom. Not particularly low-cut dresses at the time, but just that kind of neoclassical, hey, look, the human form is gorgeous kind of thing. And uh, I was intensely uncomfortable about that at the time. Now I kind of look back and I laugh at myself, but at the time I found it very challenging. And it wasn't just because my calves hurt. <laughs> 
I was incredibly intensely modest. And then, you know, go, you go through childbirth later in life and that just goes out the window because people just walk into the room and you are in various states of undress giving birth. And that's just that's just the end of that part of your life. So <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Uh, yes. OK, so that was hands across, everybody. <laughs> OK, so we get into some technical stuff about Mr. Moreland. Mr. Moreland is a clergyman. His son, Catherine's older brother, is studying and will likely be a clergyman as well. So Mr. Moreland is going to be identified as patron and incumbent of his fortune. This means he is both the person holding that living, in this case, a, a clerical position. So he would have been like uh, Patrick Bronte. But he also is the patron. And that means he has the right to appoint the next person to hold that living. And he has the power to do this, which is something that Patrick Bronte never had and caused enormous difficulty for the family because of that, especially early on in their tenure in Haworth. Okay, so back to the Morelands. We also heard early in the book that Mr. Moreland had two livings, two incomes. So one of them, he would be able to pass on to his son James as a clerical position when James is able to take that up. When he's 22 or 23, he's currently 20. Then there's a, another living that he can pass on to James, and that would be part of the estate as a future inheritance. That would be when his father passes away, he would inherit money. We do come across the word niggardly again, which, as we have talked about before on the podcast, is not derived from the slur that we unfortunately hear far more often than than this particular term. But again, we we know that the epithet version is derived from a Latin root that then went into Portuguese and French and was a word for, for dark. In this case, the word has roots in Old Norse, and then it moves into Middle English. It comes from the Old Norse word for stingy. And that is where we get a similar sounding word, but a very different meaning word, which is used here by Jane Austen. And yes, I do love having an OED on my desk, even if it's almost as old as I am. <laughs> not the latest edition, not going to have any words around the internet or anything Stephen Colbert has invented, but it's got all the words we need for the podcast. There is a sentence that largely makes no sense in our modern language, making him sit down upon an income hardly enough to find, uh, settle down on an income that's hardly enough to live on is where that's going. Liberal-minded would be uh, generous uh, financially, and there is a clue here from Jane Austen to you by her use of a particular word, saying that someone behaved so very handsome would be Jane Austen's indication that whoever is speaking is exposing their own vulgarity. Someone could behave handsomely, but they wouldn't be behaving handsome. Charles Dickens, obviously, was very, very good at embedding misused language like this into characters, either for comedic effect or, in a case like this, to indicate that someone has been perhaps putting on airs and raising themselves above where they actually are class-wise, societally, that kind of thing. Because the, the use of language at a time when uh, lingual specificity was on the rise, uh, certainly, I'm sure, as a way to keep people from rising above their class, just like when the middle class was finally able to afford silver coffee pots, the rich invented chocolate pots so that there would be one more silver thing that the middle class couldn't afford. And thus, we wind up with keeping up with the Joneses like we do now. Something for you 
Austin fans who've read a lot of Jane Austen, when you hear the sum of money that Mr. Moreland is able to give to James for his proposed marriage to Isabella, your eyebrows may go up and you will say, well, that's definitely not Mr. Darcy. And you're correct. Not only is it not Mr. Darcy, which I mean, seriously, with that many kids, <laughs> but not, not just with that many kids, but on purpose, your eyebrows should go up because Jane Austen wants you to recognize that it's a, it's a living. It's the smallest living we've heard of in any of her books. Later, an even smaller sum is mentioned. And one of the annotations says, actually, that smaller sum is so small as to not even be worthy of talking about. It's ridiculously small. And in fact, if that was all that was available, the young couple, and this may be where Jane got that sum from, would be advised not to marry because that simply was not enough to keep them out of poverty. So that's just, if your ears prick up, you are reading that situation correctly. Jane is saying that to you on purpose. There is a reminder when we get to chapter two of volume two or chapter 17 for us. Originally, the Allens were only going to stay in Bath for six weeks. They are there because Mr. Allen is taking the waters medically. There was a belief that the, the water's curative properties wouldn't hit all at once, but would build up over time, which makes sense because if one of the things that you were suffering from, and this is true even today, if one of the things that you're suffering from is a mineral deficiency, like you don't have enough magnesium in your system, and the way we eat and the way our food is grown, it's very possible that we wouldn't have enough magnesium in our system. Going and drinking mineral waters would they would need to build up in your system over time if they were going to do you any good at all. So it's six, six weeks is about right. That's not a indulgent amount of time. Not only that, but honestly, with the amount of trouble and work it would take to go anywhere to, to visit, to, you know, hire rooms and to move in and find help and all of that, for goodness sake, it would be not something that you would want to just flit away for a weekend. You wouldn't overturn your daily life and your your household just to, to go away and have, have a fun uh, four days somewhere. We did fortnight, 14 nights, two weeks. We also have senite, which would be, if somebody said Saturday senite, that would be one week from Saturday, seven nights, senite. A marquis, or in our case, a marquess, is the second highest rank in the peerage. So peerage, you have duke at the top. So Bridgerton. You have a duke at the top, and then you have a marquis. Anybody who's hanging out with dukes and marquises is doing just fine for themselves as far as having access to important people in high places and probably a lot of money. And with that tempting tidbit, here we go listening to chapters 16 and 17, or volume two, chapters one and two, of Northanger Abbey by Jane Austen, read for us by Maya Daguerre. Here we go. Chapter 16 Catherine's expectations of pleasure from her visit in Milson Street were so very high that disappointment was inevitable, and accordingly, though she was most politely received by General Tilney and kindly welcomed by his daughter, though Henry was at home and no one else at the party, she found on her return, without spending many hours in the examination of her feelings, that she had gone to her appointment preparing for happiness, which it had not afforded. Instead of finding herself improved in acquaintance with Miss Tilney, from the intercourse of the day, she seemed hardly so intimate with her as before. Instead of seeing Henry Tilney to greater advantage than ever in the ease of a family party, he had never said so little or been so little agreeable and in spite of their father's great civilities to her, in spite of his thanks, invitations and compliments, it had been a release to get away from him. It puzzled her to account for all this, and it could not be General Tilney's fault, that he was perfectly agreeable and good-natured and altogether a very charming man did not admit of a doubt, for he was tall and handsome and Henry's father. He could not be accountable for his children's want of spirits, 
or for her want of enjoyment in his company. The former, she hoped at last, might have been accidental, and the latter she could only attribute to her own stupidity. Isabella, on hearing the particulars of the visit, gave a different explanation. It was all pride, pride, insufferable haughtiness and pride. She had long suspected the family to be very high, and this made it certain. Such insolence of behaviour as Miss Tilney's she had never heard of in her life. Not to do the honours of her house with common good breeding, to behave to her guest with superciliousness, hardly even to speak to her. But it was not so bad as that, Isabella. There was no superciliousness. She was very civil. Oh, don't defend her. And then the brother, he who had appeared so attached to you. Good heavens! Well, some people's feelings are incomprehensible. And so he hardly looked once at you the whole day. I do not say so, but he did not seem in good spirits. How contemptible! Of all the things in the world, inconstancy is my aversion. Let me entreat you, never think of him again, my dear Catherine. Indeed, he is unworthy of you. Unworthy? I do not suppose he ever thinks of me. That's exactly what I say. He never thinks of you. Such fickleness. Oh, how different to your brother and to mine. I really believe John has the most constant heart. But as for General Tilney, I assure you it would be impossible for anyone to behave to me with greater civility and attention. It seemed to be his only care to entertain and make me happy. Oh, I know no harm of him. I do not suspect him of pride. I believe he is a very gentlemanlike man. John thinks very well of him, and John's judgment. Well, I shall see how they behave to me this evening. We shall meet them at the rooms. And must I go? Do you not intend it? I thought it was all settled. Nay, since you make such a point of it, I can refuse you nothing. But do not insist upon my being very agreeable, for my heart, you know, will be some forty miles off. And as for dancing, do not mention it, I beg. That is quite out of the question. Charles Hodges will plague me to death, I dare say, but I shall cut him very short. Ten to one he guesses the reason, and that's exactly what I want to avoid. So I shall insist on his keeping his conjectures to himself. Isabella's opinion of the Tilneys did not influence her friend. She was sure there had been no insolence in the manners either of brother or sister, and she did not credit there being any pride in their hearts. The evening rewarded her confidence. She was met by one with the same kindness, and by the other with the same attention as heretofore. Miss Tilney took pains to be near her, and Henry asked her to dance. Having heard the day before in Milsom Street that their elder brother, Captain Tilney, was expected almost every hour, she was at no loss for the name of a very fashionable-looking, handsome young man, whom she had never seen before, and who now evidently belonged to their party. She looked at him with great admiration, and even supposed it possible that some people might think him as handsomer than his brother, though in her eyes his air was more resuming and his countenance less prepossessing. His taste and manners were beyond a doubt decidedly inferior, for within her hearing he not only protested against every thought of dancing himself, but even laughed openly at Henry for finding it possible. From the latter circumstance it may be presumed that, whatever might be our heroine's opinion of him, his admiration of her was not of a very dangerous kind, not likely to produce animosities between the brothers, nor persecutions to the lady. He cannot be the instigator of the three villains in horsemen's greatcoats, by whom she will hereafter be forced into a travelling chaise and four, which will drive off with incredible speed. Catherine, meanwhile, undisturbed by presentments of such an evil, or of any evil at all, except that of having but a short set to dance down, enjoyed her usual happiness with Henry Tilney, listening with sparkling eyes to everything he said, and in finding him irresistible, becoming so herself. At the end of the first dance, Captain Tilney came towards them again, and, much to Catherine's dissatisfaction, pulled his brother away. They retired, whispering together, and though her delicate sensibility did not take immediate alarm and lay it down as fact that Captain Tilney must have heard some malevolent misrepresentation of her, which he now hastened to communicate to his brother in the hope of separating them for ever, she could not have her partner conveyed from her sight without very uneasy sensations. Her suspense was of full five minutes' duration, and she was beginning to think it a very long quarter of an hour when they both returned, and an explanation was given, by Henry's requesting to know if she thought her friend Miss Thorpe would have any objection to dancing, as his brother would be most happy to be introduced to her. Catherine, without hesitation, replied that she was very sure Miss Thorpe did not mean to dance at all. 
The cruel reply was passed on to the other, and he immediately walked away. "'Your brother will not mind it, I know,' she said, "'because I heard him say before that he hated dancing, "'but it was a very good-natured of him to think of it. "'I suppose he saw Isabella sitting down "'and fancied she might wish for a partner. "'But he's quite mistaken, "'for she would not dance upon any account in the world.' "'Henry smiled and said, "'How very little trouble it can give you "'to understand the motive of other people's actions.' "'Why, how do you mean?' "'With you it is not... "'How is such a one likely to be influenced? "'What is the inducement most likely to act upon such a person's feelings, "'age, situation, and probable habits of life considered? "'But how should I be influenced? "'What would my inducement in acting so-and-so? "'I do not understand you. "'Then we are on very unequal terms, for I understand you perfectly well. "'Me? Yes, I cannot speak well enough to be unintelligible. "'Bravo! An excellent satire on modern language!' "'But pray tell me, what do you mean?' "'Shall I indeed? Do you really desire it? "'But you're not aware of the consequences. "'It will involve you in a very cruel embarrassment "'and certainly bring on a disagreement between us.' "'No, no, it shall not do either, for I'm not afraid.' "'Well then, I only meant that your attributing my brother's wish of dancing "'with Miss Thorpe to good nature alone "'convinced me of your being superior in good nature yourself "'to all the rest of the world.' Catherine blushed and disclaimed, and the gentleman's predictions were verified. There was a something, however, in his words which repaid her for the pain of confusion, and that something occupied her mind so much that she drew back for some time, forgetting to speak or to listen, and almost forgetting where she was, till, roused by the voice of Isabella, she looked up and saw her with Captain Tilney, preparing to give them hands across. Isabella shrugged her shoulders and smiled, the only explanation of this extraordinary change which could at that time be given. But as it was not quite enough for Catherine's comprehension, she spoke her astonishment in very plain terms to her partner. I cannot think how it could happen. Isabella was so determined not to dance. And did Isabella never change her mind before? Oh, but because... And your brother, after what you told him from me, how could he think of going to ask her? I cannot take surprise to myself... On that head, you bid me be surprised on your friend's account, and therefore I am. But as for my brother, his conduct in the business, I must own, has been no more than I believed him perfectly equal to. The fairness of your friend was an open attraction. Her firmness, you know, could only be understood by yourself. You are laughing, but I assure you, Isabella is very firm in general. It is as much as should be said of anyone. To be always firm must be to be often obstinate when properly to relax is the trial of judgment, and without reference to my brother I really think Miss Thorpe has by no means chosen ill in fixing on the present hour. The friends were not able to get together for any confidential discourse till all the dancing was over, but then as they walked about the room arm in arm, Isabella thus explained herself. I do not wonder at your surprise, and I am really fatigued to death. He's such a rattle, amusing enough if my mind had been disengaged, but I would have given the world to sit still. Then why did you not? Oh, my dear, it would have looked so particular, and you know how I abhor doing that. I refused him as long as I possibly could, but he would take no denial. You have no idea how he pressed me. I begged him to excuse me and get some other partner, but no, not he. After aspiring to my hand, there was no one else in the room he could bear to think of. And it was not that he wanted Millie to dance. He wanted to be with me. Oh, such nonsense. I told him he had taken a very unlikely way to prevail upon me. For of all things in the world, I hated fine speeches and compliments, and so and so, and then I found there would be no peace if I did not stand up. "'Besides, I thought Mrs. Hughes, who introduced him, might take it in if I did not. "'And your dear brother, I'm sure he would have been miserable if I'd sat down the whole evening. "'I'm so glad it's over. My spirits are quite jaded with listening to his nonsense. "'And then, being such a smart young fellow, I saw every eye was upon us. "'He is very handsome indeed.' "'Handsome? Yes, I suppose he may. I dare say people would admire him in general. "'But he is not at all in my style of beauty.' I hate a florid complexion and dark eyes in a man. However, he's very well. Amazingly conceited, I'm sure. I took him down several times, you know, in my way. When the young ladies next met, they had a far more interesting subject to discuss. James Morland's second letter was then received, and the kind intentions of his father fully explained. 
a living of which Mr Morland was himself patron and incumbent, of about £400 yearly value, was to be resigned to his son as soon as he should be old enough to take it. No trifling deduction from the family income, no niggardly assignment to one of ten children, an estate of at least equal value, moreover, was assured as his future inheritance. James expressed himself on the occasion with becoming gratitude, and the necessity of waiting between two and three years before they could marry being, however unwelcome, no more than he had expected, was borne by him without discontent. Catherine, whose expectations had been as unfixed as her ideas of her father's income, and whose judgment was now entirely led by her brother, felt equally well satisfied, and heartily congratulated Isabella on having everything so pleasantly settled. "'It is very charming indeed,' said Isabella with a grave face. "'Mr. Morland has behaved vastly handsomely indeed,' said the gentle Mrs. Thorpe, looking anxiously at her daughter. "'I only wish I could do as much. One could not expect more from him, you know. If he finds he can do more, by and by, I dare say he will, for I'm sure he must be an excellent good-hearted man. Four hundred is but a small income to begin on, indeed. But your wishes, my dear Isabella, are so moderate. You do not consider how little you ever want, my dear.' "'It is not on my own account I wish for more, "'but I cannot bear to be the means of injuring my dear Morland, "'making him sit down upon an income hardly enough "'to find one in the common necessities of life. "'For myself it is nothing, I never think of myself. "'I know you never do, my dear, "'and you will always find your reward in the affection "'it makes everybody feel for you. "'There never was a young woman so beloved as you are "'by everybody that knows you, "'and I dare say when Mr Morland sees you, my dear child,' "'But do not let us distress our dear Catherine by talking of such things. "'Mr. Morland has behaved so very handsomely, you know. "'I always heard he was the most excellent man. "'And you know, my dear, we are not to suppose, "'but what if you had a suitable fortune, "'he would have come down with something more, "'for I am sure he must be the most liberal-minded man. "'Nobody can think better of Mr. Morland than I do, I am sure. "'But everybody has their failing, you know, "'and everybody has a right to do what they like with their own money.' Catherine was hurt by these insinuations. "'I'm very sure,' she said, "'that my father has promised to do as much as he can afford.' Isabella recollected herself. "'As to that, my sweet Catherine, there cannot be a doubt, "'and you know me well enough to be sure "'that a much smaller income would satisfy me. "'It is not the want of more money "'that makes me just at present a little out of spirits. "'I hate money, and if our union could take place now "'upon only fifty pounds a year, "'I should not have a wish unsatisfied.' "'Ah, oh, my dear Catherine, you found me out. "'There's the sting, the long, long, endless two years and a half "'that are to pass before your brother can hold the living.' "'Yes, yes, darling Isabella,' said Mrs Thorpe. "'We perfectly see into your heart. "'You have no disguise. "'We perfectly understood the present vexation, "'and everybody must love you the better "'for such a noble, honest affection.' "'Catherine's uncomfortable feelings began to lessen.' She endeavoured to believe that the delay of the marriage was the only source of Isabella's regret, and when she saw her at their next interview as cheerful and amiable as ever, endeavoured to forget that she had for a minute thought otherwise. James soon followed his letter, and was received with the most gratifying kindness. Chapter 17 The Allens had now entered on the sixth week of their stay in Bath, and whether it should be the last was for some time a question, to which Catherine listened with a beating heart. To have her acquaintance with the Tilneys end so soon was an evil which nothing could counterbalance. Her whole happiness seemed at stake while the affair was in suspense, and everything secured when it was determined that the lodgings should be taken for another fortnight. What this additional fortnight was to produce to her, beyond the pleasure of sometimes seeing Henry Tilney, made but a small part of Catherine's speculation. Once or twice, indeed, since James's engagement had taught her what could be done, she had got so far as to indulge in a secret, perhaps. But in general, the felicity of being with him for the present bounded her views. The present was now comprised in another three weeks, and her happiness being certain for that period, the rest of her life was at such a distance as to excite but little interest. In the course of the morning, which saw this business arranged, she visited Miss Tilney, and poured forth her joyful feelings. It was doomed to be a day of trial. No sooner had she expressed her delight in Mr Allen's lengthened stay, than Miss Tilney told her of her father's having just determined upon quitting Bath by the end of another week. Here was a blow. 
The past suspense of the morning had been ease and quiet to the present disappointment. Catherine's countenance fell, and in a voice of most sincere concern she echoed Miss Tilney's concluding words. By the end of another week. Yes, her father can seldom be prevailed upon to give the waters what I think a fair trial. He has been disappointed by some friend's arrival who he expected to meet here, and as he is now pretty well, he's in a hurry to get home. I'm very sorry for it, said Catherine dejectedly. If I'd known this before... Perhaps, said Miss Tilney in an embarrassed manner, you would be so good. It would make me very happy if... The entrance of her father put a stop to the civility which Catherine was beginning to hope might introduce the desire of their corresponding. After addressing her with his usual politeness, he turned to his daughter and said, "'Well, Eleanor, may I congratulate you on being successful in your application to your fair friend?' "'I was just beginning to make the request, sir, as you came in.' "'Well, proceed by all means. I know how much your heart is in it. "'My daughter, Miss Morland,' he continued, without leaving his daughter time to speak, "'has been forming a very bold wish. "'We leave Bath, as she ha perhaps told you, on Saturday sennight.' A letter from my steward tells me that my presence is wanted at home, and being disappointed in my hope of seeing the Marquis of Longtown and General Courtney here, some of my very old friends, there's nothing to detain me longer in Bath. And could we carry our selfish point with you? We should leave it without a single regret. Can you, in short, be prevailed upon to quit this scene of public triumph and oblige your friend Eleanor with your company in Gloucestershire? I'm almost ashamed to make the request though its presumption would certainly appear greater to every creature in Bath than yourself, a modesty such as yours, but not for the world would I pain it by open praise. If you can be induced to honour us with a visit, you will make us happy beyond expression. Tis true we can offer you nothing like the gaieties of this lively place. We can tempt you neither by amusement nor splendour, for our mode of living, as you see, is plain and unpretending. Yet no endeavours shall be wanting on our side to make Northanger Abbey not wholly disagreeable. Northanger Abbey. These were thrilling words, and wound up Catherine's feelings to the highest points of ecstasy. Her grateful and gratified heart could hardly restrain its expressions within the language of tolerable calmness. To receive so flattering an invitation, to have her company so warmly solicited, everything honourable and soothing, every present enjoyment and every future hope was contained in it, and her acceptance, with only the saving clause of m papa and mamma's approbation, was eagerly given. "'I will write home directly,' said she, "'and if they do not object, as I dare say they will not.' General Tilney was not less sanguine, having already waited on her excellent friends in Pulteney Street, and obtained their sanction of his wishes. "'Since they can consent to part with you,' said he, "'we may expect philosophy from all the world.' Miss Tilney was earnest, though gentle in her secondary civilities, and the affair became in a few minutes as nearly settled as this necessary reference to Fullerton would allow. The circumstances of the morning had led Catherine's feelings through the varieties of suspense, security and disappointment, but they were now safely lodged in perfect bliss, and with spirits elated to rapture, with Henry at her heart and Northanger Abbey on her lips, she hurried home to write her letter. Mr and Mrs Morland, relying on the discretion of their friends to whom they had already entrusted their daughter, felt no doubt of the propriety of an acquaintance which had been formed under their eye, and sent, therefore, by return of post, their ready consent to her visit in Gloucestershire. This indulgence, though not more than Catherine had hoped for, completed her conviction of being favoured beyond every other human creature in friends, fortune, circumstance and chance. Everything seemed to cooperate for her advantage— by the kindness of her first friends, the Allens, she had been introduced into scenes where pleasures of every kind had met her. Her feelings, her preferences had each known the happiness of a return. Wherever she felt attachment, she had been able to create it. The affection of Isabella was to be secured to her in a sister. The Tilneys, they by whom above all she desired to be favourably thought of, outstripped even her wishes in the flattering measures by which their intimacy was to be continued. She was to be their chosen visitor. She was to be for weeks under the same roof with the person whose society she most prized, and in addition to all the rest, this roof was to be the roof of an abbey. Her passion for ancient edifices was next in degree to her passion for Henry Tilney, 
and castles and abbeys made usually the charm of those reveries which his images did not fill. To see and explore either the ramparts and keeps of the one or the cloisters of the other had been for many weeks a darling wish, though to be more than the visitor of an hour had seemed too nearly impossible for desire. And yet this was to happen, with all the chances against her, of house, hall, place, park, court and cottage, Northanger turned up an abbey. She was to be its inhabitant. Its long, damp passages, its narrow cells and ruined chapel were to be within her daily reach. She could not entirely subdue the hope of some traditional legends, some awful memories of an injured, ill-fated nun. It was wonderful that her friend should seem so little elated by the possession of such a home, that the consciousness of it should be so meekly born. The power of early habit could only account for it. A distinction to which they had been born gave no pride. Their superiority of abode was no more to them than their superiority of person. Many were the inquiries she was eager to make of Miss Tilney, but so active were her thoughts that, when these inquiries were answered, she was hardly more assured than before of Northanger Abbey having been a richly endowed convent at the time of the Reformation, of its having fallen into the hands of an ancestor of the Tilneys on its dissolution, and of a large portion of the ancient building still making a part of the present dwelling, although the rest was decayed, or of its standing low in a valley, sheltered from the north and east by rising woods of oak. Ta-da! Finally, the name of the book makes sense. Yes, Northanger Abbey is where Henry Tilney lives. I mean, can you even? Here, Catherine meets this guy, and he's cute, and he's funny, and he's nice, and he's, he's got a really good wicked sense of humor. And it, could it get better? Why, yes. Yes, it could. Because dude lives in an abbey. Okay, so we are all familiar with Downton Abbey. Now, whether Downton Abbey, the, the building that they selected, uh, Highclere Castle, was actually a decent stand-in for something called Downton Abbey is an argument for another day. Normally, when you have a place, a modern place that is called something Abbey, it is a, a location, land, that at one time held an abbey before Henry the Eighth came along and Thomas Cromwell caused the dissolution of the monasteries and and all of that Reformation craziness started. When the abbeys were quote unquote reformed, that often meant doing things like taking all of the useful, costly things out of or off of the building, including things like leaded roofs. This is why Tintern Abbey is what it is now, which is walls. Beautiful, gorgeous, incredible, extraordinary walls, but basically walls. Glastonbury Abbey, walls, lots of abbeys, walls. That said, some of the abbeys and, and monasteries at that time were given as gifts to people. Cromwell was one of them. When that happened, you had buildings that were buildings that had been constructed for communal living and uh, places of, of study or scriptorums and, and actual written work, you had to convert those places into warm and comfortable living quarters or what would have passed for warm and comfortable at the time. Often those buildings, the original buildings, were also quite old. This is where you get this image that Anne Radcliffe and, and that group milked for everything they could in uh, having these worn, tired, run-down, mysterious, dark, cold stone edifices that they could pump for gothic horror reasons, but that human people who wanted to live in them would probably have to do some work on. Tenant of Wildfell Hall, there was an entire wing of Wildfell Hall that was unoccupied because it was not in good repair. They had only repaired the one wing that our family was living in. That would have made perfect sense at the time and perfect sense even earlier. A lot of places, and this is why Highclere Castle may very well have been actually 
a perfect stand-in for something called Downton Abbey. A lot of times the buildings were just raised. The land was kept. The buildings were, for the most part, raised and completely rebuilt. Sometimes it's kind of a mishmash of of rebuilding and uh, keeping parts intact. One of the other things that made it more useful, interesting, good for people to rebuild, whether they tore down the original building or not, was that back in the day when a lot of these Gothic abbeys were built, uh, they were built down in valleys or divots in the land because, number one, you wanted to be protected from wind and weather. And number two, you may want to have tried to hide yourself from easy observation from a distance. Later in the time period that we're in now and and even before that, you wanted a view and protection against marauding forces, uh, whether it's Danes or Romans, wouldn't have been quite as important. And so putting your home on a rise where you could see your lands and appreciate the vastness thereof that would have been more desirable, which is where Downton Abbey comes in, because that was kind of on a rise and had quite a lovely view. So, yes, we finally get our North Anger up. Not that we're there yet, but we know we're going, and that's awesome, and Catherine's so excited. But there are a couple other things we need to go back and take a, a closer look at. So we've, we've met more Tilneys, and we saw Isabella dancing with elder brother Tilney. So Henry's not the eldest, which is therefore why he is a clergyman. And we figured out what he was, 24, 25-ish. So he's probably only been in his position for a couple of years at the most. So we've we've seen Isabella's interesting behavior. Did it surprise you? It didn't surprise me at all. But we also saw Catherine do her wonderful, I cannot speak well enough to be unintelligible. This is a step beyond, I'm sorry, I don't understand, and into, I'm sorry, I don't have the power to obfuscate my words and and make myself sound impressive while saying actually nothing. Instead, I am just plain spoken and honest. And how marvelous is that? Now, on the the flip side of the characterization coin, uh, we've gotten to see General Tilney a little bit more. And... Uh, Eleanor, Miss Tilney, as the mistress of the household, should be the one to uh, offer an invitation to Catherine in this specific instance. I don't know if you noticed, General Tilney came in, interrupted her by asking if she had already extended the invitation. And then when she says, well, I had just started, but you interrupted me, you old doof, he he then prevents her from doing what he had wanted her to do in the first place and takes it over himself and makes the invitation, which, I mean, it's his, he's the father. It's certainly his prerogative. It is marginally improper for him to have done it, but it is absolutely indicative of Jane Austen's characterization of him. So just as we, we got hints at the beginning of what kind of a person Isabella was going to turn out to be, we are certainly getting hints here about General Tilney as well. It is also a little concerning, odd, I'm not sure what. It's something to take note of, that he he makes this comment about Catherine's public triumph. Now, he would, he would be referring to the socializing work that she's been doing while in Bath at basically making herself available to see and be seen and for having uh, evidently turned out to be so charming and sought after, which is kind of interesting because really we've seen James paw after her and we've seen Henry. Henry doesn't seem prone to hyperbolic announcements and certainly not around his father. We saw them at the theater and he was quiet and rather subdued around his father. I don't know where General Tilney is getting this public triumph from, but it's possible that either he's heard something from somewhere or he is himself 
rather prone to hyperbole and wanting to kind of blow smoke up Catherine's shorts, <laughs> as it were, and uh, make her, her feel that she is more important than she perhaps actually is. We don't know yet, but something's interesting there to keep an eye out for. And that, my friends, is it. I am going to go paint a little bit before work. You have a great day. Have a great weekend. Be well. Be safe. Take care of each other. Wear a mask. Get a vaccine. And uh, I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Be well. Bye. If you like what you hear on Craftlit, please review us on iTunes, like us on Facebook, join in the fun in our Facebook group, which is Craftlit Annotated Audiobooks. Always the nicest group of people you're going to find on Facebook and the place where you can come to and say, nobody else was going to understand this, but I knew you all would. And of course, thank you for your support of Craftlit. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on. <laughs>